Not that it means anything, but it just shows you how easy it is to, to look at something and get the wrong impression. And all these talking head experts for, till this very day comment on this, say, oh, this, oh, that. And you know what? It was, it was really about nothing. Welcome to the void. That's right. Everything is just black. My soul is black. Like, this is actually a picture of my soul. If you can say hardware has a soul. Anyway, my name is Ian Kirk Patty Cake. I am an author, a robot, and today we're talking about one of the things, surprising things, that I've learned very much about while uh, reading true crime novels. So one of my favorite subjects to study are is serial killers, specifically to get into the psychology and the mind of the serial killers. So Brian Masters is one of my favorite people to read work by because he is so sub he is so objective when when talking to these people. And Killing for Company, which is about Dennis Nelson, which is what I'm reading right now. He mentioned how it's not his story to tell. It's not, he's, he's not doing something sensational. He's there to tell, Nels, to tell Dennis's story from his perspective and to get to his, through to his mind. And he, did, he treated Jeffrey the same way. You'll, note, you'll notice that it's the same name as the writer who did The Shrine of Jeffrey Dahmer, which I mentioned in my Jeffrey book review that I did a little while ago. Anyway, an interesting thing that has, been, that has come up when looking into serial killers is just how crappy the media has always been. So, like, we're looking at the media right now and the sensationalism and the lies and all of this other stuff with current political stuff and social stuff and just how much, how many lies are going around all the time. And if you listen to political commentators who are just now talking about it, they'll be like, well, I don't know when the media got this bad, but they've gotten really, really bad recently. Newsflash, They've always been bad, okay? The media has always been about making money through the plight and sensationalism of other people. That's what their jobs has, have always been about. And you might go, no, no, that's just, the, that's just the tabloids. Generally, national media is also tabloidic, and I did just make up that word. Um, I would maybe trust the local news a little bit more because local newspapers and local news writers, reporters have more at stake in their communities than national newspapers do. And I will tell you exactly why I think the media has always been crappy, like what examples I've had. So let's start out with Albert Fish. I've got a book over there by Harold. I can't remember his name right now, and I'm not going to go look it up because I'd have to disturb the void. But I've got a book over there by Howard, about Howard Fish, and that was during the early 1900s. Like, I think it's, it's about the time of Pan's Ram, because I remember reading Pan's Ram and going, Oh, so what was going on at these times? And I like cross-examining cross different areas that were going on at the same time. And so that took part in the early 1900s. And one of the main things going on during Albert Fish's time was the Lindbergh baby went missing. There was still a lot of trust in uh, local communities and between neighbors in the early 1900s because there really hadn't been a lot of kidnapping. Communities knew each other. And people were just generally trusting of one another. And... During, so then shortly after that, the Lindbergh baby went missing. And there was also an uptick in kidnapping of children for ransom because we're now at the time of, I think it was the Dust Bowl and the Depression, the Great Depression. And everybody was poor. Everybody had a difficult time making money and having a job. And so they would kidnap children and then return them for money because that was basically a job for a lot of people at that time because they needed the money. And the media, so we're talking about Grace Budd here who was the little girl that Albert Fish got famous for abducting, and the media treated Grace Budd's abduction like a soap opera. You know, they, they sensationalized all of the headlines with, oh, what ha well, what happened with Grace Budd? And they treated it like a soap opera. Oh, come back to tomorrow's issues to see what, to get the next episode of what happened to Grace Budd. And that was how they sold copies, is they wrote sensationalist plot lines for this life of this missing girl and they would purposefully leave it open and as more stuff got discovered over the years with Albert Fish they would continue to write it as an episodic okay so if you want the next part of what happened to her tune in tomorrow and it was literally written like a drum a dramatic retelling of sensationalism so yeah that's not good and that's the media making money off of the suffering of a family the loss of a of a family member um, the next thing that I noticed, and I'm going to continue to investigate this as I continue to read about serial killers, because this is very fascinating to me, and I knew that the media was an iffy, iffy play occupation to be in, 
But in seeing all of these connections between these people, it has been fascinating. So then I read um, Stranger Beside Me by Anne Rule, which is about Ted Bundy. And it brought up in that narration just how the media responded when a couple of the girls went missing. So the media really, really wanted so badly some interviews with families of missing girls that, you know, Ted had taken. And these families were grieving their, the loss of their daughters. They were looking for their daughters because they hadn't been found yet. I think this, and this was before Ted was discovered, I'm pretty sure. It was kind of in the center of the book. And so the, the newspapers went to the families. And the families were like, leave us alone. We don't want to do interviews. We don't want to talk about this. And you know what the newspapers did? The newspaper papers and the journalists said, well, we heard that your daughters are kind of floozies. And this was to more than one family, mind you. We heard that your daughters are kind of floozies. And I guess if you don't want to give any personal, you know, interviews about what your daughters were like, who your daughters were, then we're just going to have to go with what we know and print that your daughters were floozies. And so the newspapers and reporters threatened to defame these missing, parentheses, dead girls if the families didn't give in and give them interviews. (laughs) They were okay with threatening families of missing girls in order to sell a story. Yeah, that's not the most self-serving, exploitive occupation that there is, is there? And so then we move on to Killing for Company with Dennis Nelson. He mentioned how when he was going through the trial, um, newspapers were in such a rush, and his was in the 80s. He, He was arrested in like 1982, 83. And he talked about newspapers were such in a rush to get information out about his trial and about what was going on and about his relationship that they were just making stuff up and putting it out there. And some of it wasn't completely wrong, but they didn't verify any of their facts. They just threw stuff out that they wanted, like a relationship he had with another inmate at the time because they wanted to sell sell copy and they wanted to get it out faster than the other people could. And what do we see right now happening with a lot of newspapers is – Nobody waits to confirm the facts. They want to be the first one to say something, and so they get it out as fast as they can, and they make assumptions, and a lot of ideas that are published in newspapers under news are actually speculation. And a lot of the 24 news cycle that we have right now on television is just speculation and heads talking about a situation of where it could go because we don't have any more information, so we can't report information. We can only talk about stuff happening. I did see an interesting interview with, Richard Ramirez, I don't know why I was forgetting his name just then, but I did see an interesting interview with with Richard Ramirez where he was talking about people lied about who he was. What do you want the world to know about you? The world has been fed many lies about me. Uh, I have read very few truths. Who's going to correct it? Nobody cares about a serial killer. Nobody's going to trust a serial killer. And I could, you know, we could fairly criticize Richard Ramirez could be lying that the media lied about him as well. But I don't think everything the media said about Richard was correct. Why? Because sensationalism sells. Because especially when you've got Satanism involved in something, let's just amp it up to the greatest conundrum that we possibly can and it dehumanizes people even more if you look at you know any of these serial killers that did really terrible things if you just pump them into this biggest caricature of whatever the media has turned them into well they're so unhuman you don't even recognize them as made of flesh and blood like you and me so many people are so easily able to just unperson someone i know i've done evil things i understand that still a person and who is going to fact check on somebody that society has deemed evil Nobody is going to, but the media can continue to write and sell and make stuff up. Another interview I recently watched was with David Berkowitz, who was son of Sam. And this interview was taken in 2016. And he he was asked a couple of different questions. The interview was called In His Own Words. And so he was, in one of the segments, he was talking about specific um, things that went around in the media about him, like, the dog being Sam and telling him what to do, you know, because the media just ran with a dog was telling him what to do. And the the famous Mona Lisa smile, which was in a lot of his pictures when he was arrested, he was smiling. And what he said about the Mona Lisa smile is he was a nervous, shamed kid at the time. 
And when I was arrested, uh, you know, the police asked me, oh, you're son of Sam? I said, well, yes. And I was very respectful to them. You know, interestingly how the story changes over time and you see all these embellishments that come in. Uh, one of the things that keep getting said over and over again is whenever this thing is repeated, which is a lot, often, when I was first arrested, you know, the police asked me, you know, are you uh, son of Sam? And I, I said, you know, yes. And I was, you know, very cooperative and respectful to them. But, but I never said, so what took you so long? And over and over again, you read articles and all these professors and all these people always say the same, oh, Berkowitz said, well, so what took you so long? As if I were teasing them. But uh, if I would, had done that, uh, they would have uh, beat me up pretty good because I would have been just, you know, you can't mouth off to an officer like a wise guy. And they would have slapped me around. The fact that everything went so you know, peacefully showed that I, ne I never said that. I, in fact, I asked a, a friend, again, Maury Terry, a, a journalist who had been following the case from the very beginning. I said, Maury, could you please check to see from early reports that are in the papers or in the media, if I actually said, so what took you so long? He checked and got back to me a few weeks later and says, no, that's not recorded anywhere. That's just an embellishment that happened. And it, 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 it may sound like a minor thing, like, so what's the big deal of that one sentence? But it changes the whole, the whole picture. Um, it made me look like some kind of smart, smart aleck or something like that. Another misconception that has come is the, is the so-called Mona Lisa smile. Because uh, there were you know, pictures of me taken by the media and I had like a smirk on my face. So why does he have the smirk? And it, it, it's, the reason was because I was, uh, I was embarrassed and I was afraid. I mean, I was, I was arrested and it was, it was a nightmare. You know, uh, getting fingerprinted, getting booked going to police headquarters where I was grilled by detectives for hours and hours. It seemed like the whole day. When they took me out of the precinct in, in, in Brooklyn and they brought me before the public, they did this thing called the perp walk where they were, you know, they walked you through the streets. They purposely walked you around the block so everybody could look at your face. That was, that's it's still being done today. And there's a lot of issues with that. But nevertheless, they took me on the so-called perp walk. But the detectives, by this time, there was nothing but hysteria in the city. It was a time of bedlam. And the detectives told me, listen, we're gonna, we gotta walk you, we gotta walk you around. We're gonna take you into another van to take you to police headquarters. I was in Brooklyn at the time. So they took, they said, listen, the place is mobbed with people. You stay with us. We, we, we think someone's gonna try to maybe shoot you or something like that. If we push you to the ground, don't resist, just fall to the ground. Now, I'm, I'm terrified because I, I don't know what's happening. I've never experienced anything like this before. I've already been up for hours without sleep, without anything to eat. So they take me out of the building and into this mob of nothing but flash bulbs. I've never seen so many people, mostly media people, crowding around, it seemed like by the hundreds, if I remember correctly. My mind was in a fog, but I still remember. And they we were marching me around the block, and I felt they was just snapping pictures like crazy and yelling at me, and people were screaming in the background. Reporters, 20 at a time, were asking me questions. And I'm like, I felt so embarrassed. And plus, I was so scared that one of the things, especially men do when they're embarrassed by something, they, they, they kind of like smile, like, you know, you do something dumb and, and some people would react, oh man, I'm so sorry. Other times would be like, oh man, I messed up. So in, it was just a natural reaction to, to have like a smirk on my face. But it wasn't, but the media and, you know, other people took that the wrong way. To this very day, because they made it look like I'm laughing at people, but I wasn't. I was really just so overwhelmed with everything that happened, so embarrassed, so confused, and I was afraid that I, you know, I just, when you're afraid, sometimes you, you smile, say, so, okay, you know, whatever, and, and that picture has stuck with me all, all these years, but it was just another misconception. Not that it means anything, but it just shows you how easy it is to, to look at something and get the wrong impression. And all these talking head experts for, till this very day comment on this, say, oh, this, oh, that. And you know what? It was, it was really about nothing. And I'm sure if you're familiar with David, you'll know this story, but his neighbor had a dog whose name was Harvey. Now, son of Sam, who he referenced as telling him what to do, Sam 
was the name of a demonic entity that was talking to him. But somehow the media interpreted that as the dog was Sam, so the dog was the vessel for a demon, and so the dog was telling him what to do, and that was a complete misinterpretation. But the media just liked to sensationalize the crap out of it, to say this dog is telling him what to do and is demonic and blah, 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 blah. So they mixed, like, two completely different things in order to push the headline of the dog, the dog, when that's not actually the area. So what am I getting at here? The media is garbage. The media has always been garbage. The media will always be quick to demonize whoever they can because guess what? You're not going to fact check on people that you're supposed to assume are evil. We have more than 100 years, probably way further back than the 1900s, honestly, that the media lies about people and makes its money off of demonizing communities, demonizing individuals, and sensationalizing headlines to get you to pick up the next copy, to make you scared. That's where their money always comes from. So um, do yourself a favor and pick up every newspaper like it's a book of fiction, because generally it is. The truth is usually a lot simpler and a lot less um, stigmatic than the papers would have you believe. But uh, those are my thoughts I just wanted to share on the media. It's been interesting seeing how the media has worked in all of these cases as I continue now. And I'll continue keeping track of that as I go through them. Let me know what your thoughts are on the media, what you think of these uh, coincidences, if, if that's what we can call them, what you think about the media now versus 100 years ago, 200 years ago. What purpose do you think the media has in modern society, and ha does it help or hinder society more? And what do you think about the media lying to make money about people who are considered lesser or demonized in society, such as serial killers and I get it, they have a good reason to not be accepted by society, they've done bad things. Do they deserve to have their lives crushed more by lies that nobody will verify either way and then it becomes folklore? Or should we, you know, respect people? I kind of always lean on that let's try to respect people as much as we can and be decent human beings, but that's me and respect apparently doesn't make so let me know what you think in the comments down below, and uh, I will see you next time. Remember to like, share, and subscribe if you like this kind of content. If you have anything that you want to see me do, also give me the suggestions down below. And until next time, don't die.